So, um, there's people here that are visiting Yeshiva right now? Yeah? When did you start? What, what was the first day of the program? Today. Today. Today it started. Oh, we're starting with a bang. We have Ali Marcus. This is the world's premier Jewish singer in this room. In this room. In the world. Oh, this is going to help. Okay. Hello. Oh. Thank you. This helps. I woke up with a sore throat. A little bit. You can hear. It's a little bit rough. Somebody got my tea. Baruch Hashem, the tea is helping. So, tonight, it just became Lag Ba'imer. Lag is Lamed Gimel, which is a number. Lamed is 30. Gimel is 3. Right? And that is Yom Simchasei Shal Rashbi. It's Yom Simchasei Shal Rashbi. It's his, the day of the passing of the Holy Tana, the author of the Zayar, Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai, who passed away on this day, and he asked that the day of his passing should be observed as a happy day, not as a sad day. So we're doing, uh, we're doing Rabbi Shimon's bidding by making sure there are festivities to mark the day. Furthermore, there's another reason that this is a happy day. As you know, I'm trying to figure out where the feedback is coming from. As you know, the time of Sphira is a time of minor avelis, of mourning, with a M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Um, well, why are we mourning during this time, during Sphira? Then remember, twenty-four thousand students of Rabbi Akiva were dying. That's right, and that plague that wiped them all out came to an end on this day on Lag Boimer, and therefore the restrictions, the mourning restrictions, or the restrictions that are so, supposed to impose a state <laughs> of semi mourning, are lifted on this day, and primarily. One of them that's pretty obvious 
is that during Svira, we weren't playing music, especially not live music, which brings us joy. So tonight, to show that the morning came to an end, we are uh, particular to enjoy music. So Baruch Hashem, we have music. But more than the fact that it's uh, festive and that it's sweet and it's pleasurable and everybody enjoys music, everyone enjoys music. Music is just something like people enjoy food. You enjoy a, 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 a sweet piece of food. So you enjoy good music. It's one of the things people naturally enjoy. But uh, in, in Chabad, music has a, has a special place. And it's not just because that it's enjoyable. Not just because it's pleasurable. Um, sometimes we do use things that are pleasurable in order to placate the animal soul. So, you know, that's why we have the nice, you know, wafer cookies out on the table, so that the animal will agree to sit down at the table, and then before the animal knows it, he may have heard something that will actually waken up the godly soul and uh, change his life a little bit. But that's, that's not the way we use music in, in Chabad. It's not just because it's aesthetically beautiful and it's pleasurable and it draws you in. Actually, the way we use music in Chabad is because music can accomplish something that, that words cannot. Or, or let me restate that. Music can sometimes accomplish better that which usually we use words to accomplish. What, what, what's the point of words? Why do we use words? Well, I guess, I suppose the truth is we could use words the same way most people use music, too. You could use words that are pleasurable words, poetic words, you know, fluff. Say a bunch of fluff and it sounds good, it sounds pretty, it doesn't really mean anything, but it's, you know, it's inspiring. But why do we really use words? To convey meaning. And sometimes we have such a deep meaning that words alone will not carry the meaning, and so we use a song. The, the Magid, the Baal Shem Tov's premier disciple and uh, successor, one time he, uh, he, taught, he taught a teaching that's based on a Mishnah in Shabbos. The teaching is, Kol Bale Shir, Yaitzim Bashir, Venim Shachim Bashir. And the literal meaning of that Mishnah, like I said, it's in the tractate of Shabbos, so it's speaking about the laws of Sabbath observance. Kol Bale Shir, a shir is a leash or a chain. So Bale Shir means those animals that have a, have a leash or a collar or a chain. <coughs> Yaitzim Bashir, it's permissible to take them out by their leash, meaning it's not. there's no concern for the labor of... What labor might we might be concerned for? Carrying. Carrying. Good. Good crowd. So it's it's permissible to take them out with a leash. Nimshach and Bashir, they can even be drawn along. Nim, to be Nimshach means to be drawn. Or pulled. And that's also permissible. But the Magid taught it like this. In the Magid's Kol Balei Shir, all of the possessors of a shear, shear shin yud resh, in Mishnayic Hebrew means a chain or a collar or a leash, but in Biblical Hebrew, shear, uh, shear is, a, is a song, like, Shiru Lashem Shir Chadash. Sing to, sing, to, sing to Hashem a new song. So shear means a song. So Kol Balei Shir, all of the possessors of a song, he said, the angels and the souls who serve Hashem with an ecstatic song, Yates and Bashir, they go out with a song. What does it mean they go out? They leave their selfhood. They expire. They have a song of ecstasy, of bliss, yearning for, for Hashem that causes them to transcend their own selfhood and to become absorbed in the oneness. They do this through a, through a song, a song of ecstasy. But then they're drawn back down 
They return to their selfhood. They return to their identity in order to serve Hashem in the existence that they were given. We call it Ratz of Ashuv, right? Running and returning. So that's how the Magid taught the Mishnah. And it was considered very, very controversial. And there was a Chassid, and he came to a town called Shklov. Shklov was a very um, non Hasidic, now let's say it, let's not mince words, it was a very anti Hasidic town. And there was a Chassid who came to Shklov, and the locals were chiding him, and they were saying, Tell us some Hasidis. They only wanted to make fun. So he said, oh, I'll tell you, okay. Really, it doesn't mean the animals, or in addition to the simple meaning of meaning the animals, being led with the leashes and the chains, is a deeper meaning, and it means the, the, the balishir, the possessors of a song, that means the souls and the angels who sing a song of ecstasy. They leave their selfhood with a song. They return to their selfhood <coughs> with another song. And the locals in Shklov heard this and they were absolutely enraged. Like, how can your rabbit take a simple Mishnah and distort it in such a crazy way? So they were mocking this and it became like a scandal. And then what happened is the Alter Rebbe came to Shklov. The Alter Rebbe, from all the different students of the Magid, the Alter Rebbe was known as... Uh, the ambassador to the Misnagdim. And there was a reason for that. We know the Alter Rebbe's name was Schneer, which is Shnei Oir, two lights. What are the two lights? The Alter Rebbe was Balatanya and the Baal Hashol Chanoruch. The Alter Rebbe, the first Rebbe of Chabad, he wrote the Tanya, which is the basic book of Chassidus, of Pnimiya Satayra, or Nister. And he also wrote a, uh, a revised version of the Shulchan Aruch, which is Nigla de Torah, the revealed aspects of the Torah, the code of Jewish law. So the, the Alter Rebbe, he was the one when they would go into quote-unquote enemy territory, and they needed somebody who knew how to talk in learning, somebody who was a Talmudic genius and was recognized as such, they would send the Alter Rebbe. So the Alter Rebbe came to Shklov, and uh, when he showed up, it was right at that time when there, were big, there was the big scandal about Kol Baal Eshir, Yetzim Bashir, Vin Mishachim Bashir. Anyways, he shows up, and he gets mobbed instantly as soon as they figure out who he is. And everyone wants to ask their questions. Now, they had a double motive for asking him questions. Either they would be able to show him up, if they could expose some ignorance in the Alter Rebbe, then they would, you know, anyone who could do that would be the hero of Shkov. Or, they knew he was a genius, so if he could answer their questions, then they would be satisfied. They, they got an answer to a question that they'd always been looking for. So, they all hounded him, and there, was, um, there were throngs, crowds, just surrounding him. And um, the Alter Rebbe said, this is not the way to do it. Let's call an assembly for tonight, in shul, and I'll answer all the questions. So, they made an announcement that tonight everyone's going to meet in shul. There was a certain base medrash in Shklov known as the cold shul. I'm not sure why it was called that. Maybe it was cold. It was called the cold shul. <laughs> and the Alta Rebbe, it was a big base medrash, and it was packed. Maybe it was just because it was the biggest shul. I'm not sure. But it was packed. It was packed to the rafters. Literally, you had people hanging off of every surface in the shul, people standing in the windows, hanging from the rafters. The place was packed, it was a madhouse. And the tension was so thick you could cut it with a knife because there was this big scandal about Kol Baal Eshir, Yetim Bashir, and Nimshach and Bashir, and now one of the chsidim, one of the Talmidim, the primary Talmidim of the Magid shows up, and he's going to stand at the, the, the front of the shul, and everyone's going to be able to ask their questions. And everyone came with all their hardest questions, all of the scholars of Shklov, and they were scholars, they were scholars. They came with their big questions. One of them was named Yosef Kolboy. You know why he was named Yosef Kolboy? Because Kolboy, everything was in him. He was encyclopedic in his knowledge of Torah. He knew the entire Torah, like a computer. In fact, we know this story because of Yosef Kolboy's record. 
He's the one who transmitted the story to us. And he's the one who, who, who preserved his first-hand experience of this event. So Yasef Kolbay says, the place was packed, everyone had their questions. I came with my biggest questions that I had set before the great Chachamim of Shklov and of Vilna and Slotsk, and nobody could answer my question. And I came with this question, maybe I'll get a chance to ask what they used to call him, the, the Lozhne Magid, or the Magid of Lozhne. He was the, the Alter Rebbe was from the town of Lozhne. So, he says, the Alter Rebbe got up to the Bima, and, uh, and he looked around, and he says, the most inflammatory, incendiary words that he could possibly say at that place and at that time. He says, with a full packed crowd, Kol Balishir, all of the possessors of songs, the souls and the angels, Yates and Bashir, they go out, they leave their selfhood with a song of ecstasy, and they're drawn back down into their selfhood through another song, a song of return, in order to serve Hashem. And now, we'll sing a song. You have questions? We'll sing a song. And the Alter Rebbe sang a song called the Matan Teira Nigun. And at that moment, what happened in the room? Yosef Kolba explained, he said that he felt the knots in his brain unraveling. The, the, the knots that had been tied tight for years were just coming loose. And he felt the entire room was being lifted and everyone's consciousness was being lifted. And what started to happen is everyone just had this heightened perspective. And from that, from up there, from the place where the, the Al Rebbe had lifted them, there were no questions. Yosef Kolboy says, I'm, I'm thinking about my questions, and at that point, there, it wasn't that the question was answered, it was that the, the whole topic became so clear in front of me that the, the, the question itself vanished. And it was so simple, so elegant. And it was all from, from the effect of this song. So you see, the place of, of Nigina of melody and music in Chabad is not just because a song, you know, sing me a pretty song. It's not just because of the aesthetic of it. It's because sometime there's a message that can only be transmitted through the language of song. I want to I want to tell you bad news. We don't know the Nigun Matan because Yosef Kolboy didn't preserve it. Maybe he didn't know how to write notes. <laughs> but uh, we know a lot of Nigunim from the Alter Rebbe. Nigunim that the Alter Rebbe himself composed. And uh, we're going to ask Rebbe Eli to uh, help us sing one of the Nigunim from the Alter Rebbe. You want to tell us about it? At uh, the Nikola Rebbe explains the son of the Alter Rebbe, that a song also goes in a circle. Also, you have, uh, if anybody's a student of uh, music, you have the circle of fifths. Everything goes in a circle. So a song, if it doesn't, uh, if it's not in a circle, then the pieces don't really, everything has to match and, and uh, form a circle. So, uh, in a sense, that fits in with the reference to the shear, that it's a, a, a collar, also a, some kind of a ring or a circle. So the Alter Rebbe composed ten famous uh, nigunim, um, and uh, the Hasidim would say that these, this was one of his uh, one of the things that he prided himself that he had these uh, nigunim that he composed. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the most uh, common one is called Keli Ata, and uh, we'll sing it here together. Free up your other hand. 
says it's a fabreng and stop clapping it's not a performance not a concert he's right that's why I like Eli he's a chassidah shayid first and foremost a chassid second a performer not a performer he's not a performer of a clown it just happens to be that everybody likes to watch him sing but he's a chassidah shayid that's, that's what he is Baruch Hashem so Rabbi Shimon today is Rabbi Shimon's day Rabbi Shimon ben Yichai and Rabbi Shimon was Teirasei Manasei you know what that means? Teira was his occupation most people, you have a job and uh, when you're not working and when you're not uh, helping in the house when you're not taking care of other things you're mechuyiv, you're obligated to learn Torah. But uh, 
most people don't learn Torah all day. I mean, a Bach and Shiva learns Torah all day. The Rebbe used to speak about at the Lag Bima rallies how the Tzivas Hashem, the children, the little children are like Rashbi, they're like Rabbi Shem Ben Yochai because the children are Torah and also because children don't have to pay bills. Children don't have, to, don't have to worry about taking care of their practical needs. So a child or a Bach and Yeshiva is Torah and Menasei. Torah is your occupation, your sole occupation, just like Rabbi Shimon. <coughs> Rabbi Shimon, he was so uh, lofty in his, his level of Torah that we actually find something unusual about him. We find that his Torah was, was able to accomplish what prayer normally is used for. Normally, we use prayer to elicit a request, something from heaven. And uh, Torah is about learning how Hashem's perspective on reality looks. Rabbi Shimon was able to actually learn Torah in a way that didn't just reveal Hashem's perspective, but, so to speak, change the heavenly point of view and change the reality down here. So he used Torah to accomplish what normally we, we would use prayer to accomplish. And the story is that once they were in need of rain, and so the people came to Rabbi Shimon, and they said, we need rain, can you pray for us? So Rabbi Shimon said, you know what? I won't do it through prayer. Yeah, I'll, I'll help you out. But not through prayer. I'll do it through, through Torah study. So what did Rabbi Shimon learn? He learned a posuk, a verse from Tehillim, from Psalms. There's a, there's a verse in Psalms. Hine matoiv umanoim Behold how good it is and how pleasant. Sheves achim the sitting together of brothers, or sitting of brothers, gam yochad, together. Brothers sitting together. How good and how pleasant it is when brothers sit together. So Rabbi Shimon explained like this. This is recorded in the Zayar, in the Holy Zayar. <coughs> Achim, who are the Achim? The brothers. The brothers are the Kruvim, are the cherubs on the cover of the Ark, who are, are, are described in, in, in Torah as Ish el Ochiv, each one facing its brother. In this case, there was a boy and a girl, so brother here is gender neutral, it means sibling. And we know that when there was peace between the Jewish people and Hashem, these two kruvim, these two cherubs, these two figures on top of, everyone knows the figures I'm talking about, the little figures on top of the ark cover, they look like babies with wings. You know what I'm talking about? Little Cabbage Patch dolls. <laughs> <laughs> 80s kids will remember. Why? It was only for you, man. I gave, gave you a reference there. <laughs> So when there was peace between Hashem and the Jewish people, these two little uh, kruvim, cherubs, were uh, facing each other. And when there wasn't peace, then they would actually uh, face away. And each one is called a sibling. So Rabbi Shimon said like this, how pleasant, how good and pleasant it is when siblings, meaning in this case the re representation is Hashem and the Jewish people, are dwelling yochad, together. What's gam yochad? Also together. Also together. What's the also? Why does it say also? So he said like this. When achim, meaning the Jewish people themselves, are at peace among each other, when there is Avas Yisrael and Achdus Yisrael, when Jewish people are getting along among each other, brother to brother, 
then Gam also will be the Yochad. Who's the Yochad? The oneness, the all, the one, the unity. Hashem. So, how good and pleasant it is, Sheves Achim, when Jewish people are united together, then Gam also will be Yochad, the one, the unity, the all. Hashem will be present as well. But in a place where there is unity among Jews, Hashem will be present. That's what Rabbi Shimon taught, as recorded in the Zayar. And that's what caused it to rain. Anyway, we have Hinam Atayv. There are a few versions of this as a nigun, as a, as a song. I think the one that's most famous outside of Chabad, it's like an Israeli, uh, what's the famous? <laughs> that one, right? Israeli folk song or something like that? Okay. But in Chabad, we have a bunch of Hinim right? You want to teach them to us? One by one? One by one? Yeah. Okay. You teach each each part and you like really make us learn it? Okay. Are you going to start with the first version? What's the first version? I'm just joking. This, it's random. You could call. We're going to start with Hina Matav 2. You're going to start with Hina Matav 2 and then go back to Hina Matav 1. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, no background on this one. I just. Oh, 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 oh,
composed that one? Do we know who composed the Hina Matif, uh, number two, as we're calling it? We don't know. Sometimes we know who composed the Nigun. Sometimes it reaches us and we don't know. Sometimes we know, but um, I don't know. <laughs> Could be it's known, but I don't know it. Before we uh, learn another Hina Matif, just want to speak a little bit more about this idea of Avas Yisro, about loving your fellow and its connection to Rabbi Shimon. Specifically, so we mentioned before that during this time of year, twenty-four thousand students of Rabbi Akiva perished in a plague, and uh, we know everything has a reason. Sometimes we don't know the reason, but in this case, we're told the Gemara tells us that it was a punishment. We know that uh, the righteous are judged <coughs> meticulously to the, to the to the hair's breadth. And according to the lofty standard of these students of Rabbi Akiva, what they did was uh, a capital offense. What did they do? Or what didn't they do? The Gemara tells us, They didn't treat each other respectfully. They didn't treat each other respectfully. Now the Rebbe asks a question about this. What do we know about Rabbi Akiva? I mean, we know a lot of things about Rabbi Akiva, but if you were to ask Rabbi Akiva, could you tell me what is one of the main ideas in the whole Torah? What do you think Rabbi Akiva would tell you? You know the 12 Sukkim? Everyone knows the 12 Sukkim that ever came out with 12 Torah verses and my Mori Chazal sayings of the sages. In fact, Lag is connected to the 12 Sukkim, 12 Torah verses, because the first six came out on Rosh Chedesh Iyer Tav Shin Lamed Vav, 1976, and the second six were rolled out at the Fabrengen uh, of Lag Boimer of that same year. So Lag Boimer is connected to the Twelve Sukkim. Everyone knows the Twelve Sukkim? Little kids say them word by word, and everyone chants after them, and then they get, they get candies and prizes. Tayra. Tziva, Lano, Meishe, Merasha, Kehilas, Yanke. Okay, beautiful. So there's 11 more. And one of them is That's a verse. But Zeh, of the Amr Rabbi Akiva, Zeh Klav Golubatayro. Rabbi Akiva said this is a main principle of the Torah. So here's Rabbi Akiva <coughs> who's preaching Avas Yisrael <coughs> he's saying love your fellow like yourself is a major principle of the Torah and then his students couldn't respect each other. What went wrong? And Maybe you say okay maybe they were Rabbi Akiva wannabes. They weren't really following his, his path. But now the Gemara says they were Talmidei Rabbi Akiva. They were his disciples. What were they doing wrong? You know, the Gemara says that no two people have the same mind. That no two people have the same mind. Just like no two human beings have the same facial features. That's why you have the, the biometrics, facial recognition, because no two people have the exact same face. No two people have the exact same mind. So how many different ways, if Rabbi Akiva had 24,000 students, how many different ways of being a student of Rabbi Akiva were there? 24,000, that's right. So they were all Tamid Rabbi Akiva, they were all Rabbi Akiva students, but each one of them, because each one of us has a little bit different mind, had a different spin on how to apply Rabbi Akiva's teachings. So here's the thing. Rabbi Kiva's students, they would look at each other and say, you got it all wrong. That's not what Rabbi Kiva means. And the other one would say, no, 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 you got it all wrong. What you're saying, that's not what Rabbi Kiva means. And they could have just left it there, agreed to disagree, but they couldn't. You know why? 
because they'd internalized the teaching of love your fellow like yourself. So they loved each other so much, they'd say to themselves, just like I couldn't allow myself to be so foolish, how can I allow my friend to be so foolish? So they didn't have a lack of love, they had too much love. They loved each other to death. They couldn't let each other be wrong. They couldn't just live and let live. No. Why? Because of the love. And it was it was because of that that they met their they met their end. Now, after twenty four thousand students at Rabbi Akiva perished, <coughs> Rabbi Akiva rebuilt. He rebuilt with five new students. One of those five students was Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai. By the way, what's the difference between Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai and Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai? Anyone know the difference? Aramaic or Hebrew. Aramaic or Hebrew, right. So, in the Zohar, which is Aramaic, it says Shimon Bar Yechai. And in uh, Mishnah, which Mishnah is Hebrew, it says Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai. Well, it really says Rabbi Shimon mostly. But in Lashon HaKodesh, Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai. And for whatever reason, I actually haven't found the reason, but the Rebbe always said that Rishim ben Yechai, not Bar Yechai. I know the Velt also says Bar Yechai, but the Rebbe always said that Rishim ben Yechai. So Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai was one of the five students that uh, Rabbi Akiva raised after the 24,000 students died. And in Rabbi Shimon we see a Tikkun. You know what a Tikkun is? A rectification, you know, a correction for what went wrong. We see it in a couple of ways. I'll tell you one way, and then maybe we'll learn Hinamatayv uh, number one or Hinamatayv number three. One of the ways that you see the correction of what went wrong with the previous generation of, of Rabbi Akiva students, Rabbi Shimon and his son, they, they were hiding from the, from the Romans. And Rabbi Shimon was... was outspoken in his criticism of the Roman government. So there was actually a death sentence. He had to go hide. And he, had, and he and his son were hiding in a cave. And in that cave, they lived miraculously. They, uh, there was a carob tree. Some have a custom of eating carob on Lag Bremer. There was a well of water, a well spring of water. And uh, that's how they survived in the cave. And they did nothing but study Torah the entire time. So after 12 years, they came out of the cave, and 12 years of being like in this space station, like totally separate from regular human life, and knowing nothing but deep, deep Torah study the entire time, they came out <coughs> and they saw people farming, and it blew their minds. They couldn't take it. And actually, they had a negative reaction to it, and because of the power that they had, whenever they would look at something negatively, their eyes would, would set fire to whatever they were looking at. So there was a heavenly voice that said, hey, you didn't come out here to destroy the world, get back in there. So they went back in the cave for another year. And after the 13th year, they came out, and they saw someone farming, and Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Allah, Rabbi Shimon's son, would, saw the farmer, and he was, again, he was shocked, he, was, he didn't know how to deal with it. But now Rabbi Shimon told him, he said, it's enough for the world, you and I, my son. In other words, what did he tell him? The way we live, we do nothing but learn Torah. We don't have a job. We don't have any distractions. All we do is we're constantly absorbed in holiness. That's our path. That's how we live. You don't have to hold others accountable to living that way of life. There are other ways. There are other ways to live which are equally legitimate, equally valid. And it's enough for the world <coughs> that there are two people like us. But the rest of the world doesn't have to be like us. Live and let live. In fact, one of the things that Rabbi Shimon took notice of was somebody out of Shabbos who was running with two sprigs of of of, of myrtle of, of hadas, 
And he asked him, what's it for? He says, I'm getting ready for Shabbos. I have one for Shomer and one for Zacher. Simple Jew who had a love for the observance of the mitzvah of, of, of Shabbos. Meaning he wasn't the big scholar. But how did he love Hashem and how did he serve Hashem? He, 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 by, by, he would get these sprigs of myrtle for, for sm- smelling, for good smells on Shabbos. And that's beautiful and that's fine. If Rabbi Shimon would say, well, you know what, instead of learning Torah, I'm going to you know, sniff myrtle. No, that's not okay, because Rabbi Shimon was capable of learning Torah on the level that he learned it. But each person has their way that they can serve Hashem. So you don't compare anyone else to you, and you don't compare yourself to anyone else. Each one has to compare himself to his best self. That's it. So that was the first way that Rabbi Shimon rectified and fixed where his predecessors, the first 24,000 students of Rabbi Kiva, went wrong. He was able to say, it's okay for different people to have different paths. That's one way. There's, a, there's, there's another way in the story we learn from Rabbi Shimon, but I want to learn another uh, Hine Matayv. Hine Matayv, page 126. <laughs> Everyone have your uh, songbooks? Yeah. Mental songbooks. They're mental songbooks. If you really close your eyes and meditate, you'll see the songbook. If anybody wants to get the uh, Chabad book, all the musicians out there. Um, Can we get it now? A notable idea. A notable idea down the top. Controversial third part to the nigging. A little bit controversial, yeah. <laughs> Why is it controversial? It's a big scandal. Major. Yeah. Okay. Well, people just get for, the fist uh, fights over it. For posterity's sake, it goes like this. Uh-huh.
Since it's not a performance and it's a it's a fabrengen, can we do the first inamatayv again just to make sure that we've learned it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tikkun, rectification. So Rabbi Shimon comes out of the cave. So first thing, the first thing he did, which shows us that he was not like the 24,000 students who didn't know how to honor each other, whose love became toxic and destructive, was that he was able to say, not everyone has to be the same. He told his son, you and I can learn Torah day and night without stop and uh, other people can have other ways of serving then there was another thing because you see the first thing was just what he didn't do wrong first you got to stop the bleeding right when you're trying to fix something first thing is what you should not do right the first thing when there's dysfunction is don't just do something sit there heard that saying before you think don't just sit there do something but it's counterintuitive. The truth is, don't just do something, sit there. Stop what you're doing. Stop causing destruction. So the, the, the love that's causing destruction, cut it out, sit there. So that's the first thing he did. He was able to have that uh, poise, that self-restraint, to not love in a destructive way, in an overwhelming way, an overbearing way, smothering way. Okay, so that's what not to do. That's how not to love. How should you love? Now give me a positive example how you should love. So after Rabbi Shimon came out of the cave, he said, since Hashem did a miracle for me, I want to show my gratitude. 
I want to go see if something needs fixing. Azil asking Milsa, let me go and fix something. And he came to a town and he said, does anything need fixing? And they were like, well, as a matter of fact, yeah, we got this annoying thing. There's uh, some dead bodies in the town and we don't know exactly where they are. And when the Kohanim, when the, the priests, the descendants of, of, of Aaron, you know, they're, they're not allowed to defile themselves to a corpse. Problem is we don't know exactly where those, where those corpses are. And so they have to take a circuitous route. They can't walk through the normal thoroughfare of the town. They have to go all, around, all the way around to avoid it. <coughs> so Rabbi Shimon said, fine, no problem, I'll take care of it. And he did something. You can learn about it in the Gemara. Shabbos, interestingly enough, Daf Lamed Gimel. And it really is. It's interesting. Anyway, so uh, he fixed the situation. This is an incredible lesson. What's the lesson here? You don't fix people. You fix situations. Don't fix people. People don't need to be fixed. That's not healthy love. That's controlling love. Nobody wants to be changed. Nobody wants to be told they have to be different. What do we do? We don't fix people, we fix situations. So for instance, if you see a Jew, you say, excuse me, sir, have you put on tefillin today? Are you Jewish? Have you put on tefillin? No. And you put tefillin on him. Let me ask you a serious question. Are you improving him by putting tefillin on him? No. Yes. How can you improve upon perfection? You don't improve him. You're, you're improving the situation. You're improving the situation. There's a problem. It's called ignorance and apathy and assimilation. And Jews aren't putting on Philip. And because of Arvus, the guarantorship with which we accepted the Torah at Sinai, it's not just someone else's problem, it's also my problem. But there's a big difference between thinking you're fixing a person and, think, and, and realizing that you're really just fixing a situation. There's something so arrogant about using a mitzvah it's so, it's, it cheapens the mitzvah to use the mitzvah as the way to be the one who's doing someone else a favor. Hold on a second. Maybe he's doing you a favor. Maybe he's giving you a schus, a merit, to be able to be helpful to him in his journey. Maybe not doing him a favor. He's doing you the favor. Oh, because you're religious. He's not religious. So you think you're better? You're not better. He's in a situation where his neshama came down to this world, and for whatever reason, it doesn't know about tefillin or doesn't understand it clearly enough to make it a priority, and you're helping to do something about that situation. But you're not fixing him, you're fixing the situation. And if he says no, there's no hard feelings, and if he says yes, he doesn't owe you anything. If he says no, there's no hard feelings. Don't take it personally offensive. And if he says yes, he doesn't owe you anything. If you're the guy who put tefillin on him, and you started his journey, and mitzvah gredis mitzvah, or you took him out of the category of a skull that never had tefillin on him, he doesn't owe you anything. You are fortunate that the Abishta put you in the place to be the shliach at that moment. <laughs> good things happen through good people. The healthiest interaction between two human beings I ever saw in my life was at a Chabad house around two in the afternoon on a Shabbos. I won't say where it was. It doesn't matter where it was. And from the story, you'll be able to tell that the, the rabbi who was involved would never want to be 
named. Matt Chabad House brought out to speak. One of the speeches was Shabbos Day after the uh, Kiddush. So about one o'clock or whatever it was. So I give the lecture, you know, 30, 40 minutes, whatever it is. And when I finish, you see people are looking at their watches and they're, uh, you know, they're going. They, you know, hands in the pocket. You see, they're, they're grabbing the car keys. And 90% of the people there were not Shemesh Shamas. I mean, that's just the reality. And they were looking at their watches and, okay, you know, two o'clock, got to, you know, got to go to karate practice or ballet or whatever, whatever it was, racquetball, whatever, whatever they had. Because they're not Shabbos observant people. <coughs> and uh, after 90% of the crowd left, there were about 10% of the people left over. And you could tell those were all the people who keep Shabbos. Right? Because they're still sitting there. And one of the guys is sitting next to the shliach. I'm sitting here, the shliach is sitting here, and this guy is sitting on, on the other side. And I wasn't paying attention to their conversation because someone else was talking to me. But when I tuned in, what I started to hear is the guy sitting here says to the rabbi, he says, Rabbi, I just want to thank you for changing my life. And the rabbi, the shliach, literally looked, literally looked like somebody had slapped him. It was like, it was like a sting, like... And he waited a second. He just gonna you know, gather his thoughts, I guess, find the words. And he says, "No, no, no! Don't thank me. I didn't change your life. But thank you. I want to thank you for letting me be there as a resource to you while you were changing your life." That was the healthiest interaction between two human beings I've ever seen in my life. You changed yourself. I didn't change you. I can't change you. In fact, I wouldn't want to change you. I love you how you are, so why would I want to change you? You know, the Rebbe said the difference between Noyach, Avram, and Moshe. Noyach, officially, he was supposed to change people. So he made the building of the Teva, of the Ark, take 120 years. So everyone would see him and be like, hey, what's up with that? Well, Hashem's going to punish you all. you gotta, you got to do tshuva. But he didn't get any any customers. He opened up a big yeshiva and nobody came. Avram Avino, he was more successful. You know what he used to do? He used to use hospitality. He made an eshel. Eshel is a chila shtia levia. Eat, drink, and accompaniment. And... Uh, he used to remember people would be in the desert and he would feed them food and afterwards he'd say, let's bench, let's make a blessing to Hashem and they would say, oh no, I'm not into that. And he would say, no, well then you can pay. And they would say, no, we don't want to pay. So he said, okay, so let's bless. <laughs> and he won over many adherents that way. Hanafa Shesha also the Kharab. Torah tells us that he and Sada made nefashais, they made souls, meaning they made followers who they brought under the wings of the Shekhinah. But you see, the way that Avraham Avinu was loving people was with a little bit of a pnia. Pnia means an ulterior motive. He was loving them for really, really good reasons, for really noble reasons. He wanted them to do tshuva. He wanted them to do the right thing. But he was loving them in order to get them to do the right thing. <coughs> I told you I woke up this morning with my, my throat burning. <coughs> His love was even greater than that. When people got caught up in the Chet Egel, the sin of the golden calf, and told Hashem, forgive them, not because they'll do teshuva, not because there are extenuating circumstances. No, he just said, forgive them, period. And if you don't, it's non-negotiable. Erase me from your book. If they go, I go. So Meishu Rabbeinu was saying, here are sinners. I'm not promising you that they're going to improve. 
I'm not, I'm not promising I'm going to help them do tshuva. I'm saying take them as is. And if you don't take them as is, you get rid of me too. That's Avas Yisro. That's the love that we're demanded to feel and to, 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 to display. Not the love that I love you so much I'm going to help you be better. They say, I don't know if this is a good joke for Bahram, but they say uh, when a man and a woman get married, the man gets married with the, based on the hope that his wife will never change. And his wife gets married based on the hope that he will change. So you love somebody based on what you think you can turn them into. Just died? What? Because it was an hour. So you gotta wait. It's the Instagram live over there. When did it uh, when did it time out? Just now? Okay. So uh, you wanna figure it out and uh, you can start a new one in like a minute, I think. That's my production assistant, Avram Abba. He helps me out. The love that Moshe Rabbeinu has for every Jew is unconditional. He doesn't love you because he sees the potential in you and how he can improve you and what you'll look like if you go to yeshiva and you become religious. He's not investing in you, you understand? There are some people who will invest in you. They will take a look at you and they'll try to make a determination what is the likelihood that, that what is it called, return on investment, ROI, right? So, I'm running a yeshiva, and I, I'm sorry, I mean, we have limited resources. We have a building, we've got to pay utilities, we've got to pay teachers. And we have to find the students where there's a good ROI. And if this guy is just going to come and, and, and learn Torah, and at the end of it, we have no promise that he's going to join a from community and he's going to send his kids to yeshiva. We just wasted all these resources on him. Does that sound too cynical? <laughs> Trust me when I tell you, the way I'm saying it right now is sugar-coated. The reality is worse than that. The Avos Yisrael of Moshe Rabbeinu is that you don't have to earn a place here you don't have to promise to earn the right to be one of us. You're already one of us. And you're no different than all of us. In fact, we're all different in our own special way. And in the eyes of Hashem, we're all equally, infinitely valuable. And I could, I could never even dare try to improve on that. How could I improve upon perfection? So let me ask you again. You put tefillin on a Jew. Are you improving him? No, you are not. How could you improve a perfect neshama? Ha neshama shinasata bi tohidahi. Neshama is perfect and pure. The problem is the situation. That pure soul came down to a body, and this body is a rough neighborhood. You know what Elam Hazar, the physical world, is like? All the temptation, all the distraction. You know Levi Yitzchak Radichava? You ever heard of him? Reb Levi Yitzchak was the big lover of the Jews. And he used to exonerate the Jews. He would argue. He was the defense attorney. So one time, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak he said, Hashem, look at what you did. You took all of the truth and the light and the wisdom and you hid it in the books, in the holy books. And you took all the temptation and the worldly pleasure and you dangled it in front of our faces. Of course people sin. Imagine if you had done it the opposite way. That the light and the truth and the wisdom were smack dab right in the front of our in front of our eyes, and all the the foolishness and distraction would be written in some obscure book that you'd have to actually go hunt down and find in order to even find out about. Then nobody would sin. But Hashem did the opposite, and He put souls in bodies, and He put bodies in this world, and that's a messed up situation called Gullus called exile. And we're here to fix the situation. 
Hey, he's a little Askin Milsa. Let me go fix something. Let me improve the situation a little bit. Let me make a little bit more light in this world. If I can do it, by, I put on my own fill. Help another Jew put on fill. Go to yeshiva, learn Torah. Leave yeshiva, get a job. Give Sadoka, have a family. What? There's no limit to the ways to make more light in the world. Through your own Yiddishkeit, through somebody else's Yiddishkeit. There are all ways of making more light in the world. But you're not improving on people, you're improving upon the situation. That's the Avos Yisrael of Meish Rabbeinu. That's the Avos Yisrael of Rabbi Shimon ben Yechai. And that is the Avos Yisrael of all of the Tzediki Hadayr. The Nesim, the real leaders of the Jewish people through the generations. They saw Jews and they said, I cannot improve upon perfection. The situation is a mess. And we're going to do something about the situation. And we're going to teach Chassidus and Pinin Yisa and reveal all the secrets of the Torah in order to improve the situation. And we're going to send out Shluchim in order to improve the situation. But a Jew, a Jew is perfection. You can't improve upon perfection. That's, that's, that's Avos Yisroh. The real Avos Yisroh. Which every one of you here is worthy of. You, you want to teach us another Hinnim Atayv? You need the mic? Do a little Hagdoma? So this uh, the third Hinnim Atayv is actually a, a Nigan from Simchas Torah that was adopted as a Hinnim Atayv. And uh, do you guys know the Sisu of Simcho uh, Nigan? So he just replaced the words with Hinemate. Just make sure we learned the, the first Hinamatev that you taught. Prep. We want to make sure we leave, leave the Fabrenga with one nigan that we have down solid. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, start it without me. Ooh, expert mode. I'll start you off. <laughs>
It's good. Sounds good. Sounds beautiful. You know what it says in the Hayyem Yayim? You know that Rebbe wrote a, a sefer called Hayyem Yayim, yeah? What is Hayyem Yayim? Hayyem Yayim means from day to day, or today is the day, or... Today's day, today is the day. Cafe Diem. And it's the daily thought. And sometimes it's not really clear why that day's Hayyem Yayim is connected with that day. But sometimes it's really obvious. Like tomorrow's Hayyem Yayim talks a little bit about Lag Boimer by the Mitle Rebbe, by the second Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe's son and successor, the Mitle Rebbe. I'll tell you about that in a second. But you know that Hayyem Yayim, the name Hayyem Yayim, hints to the content of the book. Um, do you know where all of the passages of Hayyem Yayim were taken from? Fidika they were all taken from the Fidika, well, not only Sichas, but the Fidika, the Sichas, or letters, my modem. They were taken from things that the, the Fidika Rebbe had written or said, and um, the Rebbe compiled them. So basically, the Rebbe, who was the consummate Rebbe of his, of the consummate Chosset of his Rebbe, his Sefer was, he took his Rebbe's teachings and he arranged them. And uh, the name Hayyim Yayim also, Yud Vav Mem, is Yayim. So it's Ha Yud Vav Mem Yud Vav Mem, which Yud Yud, each Yayim starts with Yud. That's the Friedrich Rebbe's name, the previous Rebbe's name, Yosef Yitzchok. And then Mem Mem, which is the Rebbe's name, Mem Mem. And then the Vav in between, Vav is connection. So Hayyim Yayim means the Yud Yud and Mem Mem. It's the connection between the Rebbe and the Friedrich Rebbe. And the subtitle of the book, which was given by the Friedrich Rebbe when he saw the book, was Luach Oyer Zerua L'Chsidei Chabad. A calendar of implanted light for Chabad Chsidim. Oyer Zerua. Oyer Zerua is actually a Lashon Apasach. It's a turn of phrase from a verse in Psalms. Oyer Zerua L'Tzadik. Light implanted for the righteous. What, what, what does Oyer Zerua mean? It means a seed of light. You know what a seed does? You put the seed in the ground and it grows exponentially, really infinitely, because every seed can continue infinite generations. It has the koya, has the potential for infinite growth. Like they say, any, anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only Hashem can count the apples in a seed, because really there are an infinite amount of apples in every seed in potential. So Hayyem Yem is Oyer Zeruah. It's seeds of light. Hayyem Yem takes you 30 seconds in the morning to read. 30 seconds. It's like a little seed. It's tiny. But it grows on you and it expands infinitely, taking on deeper and deeper and deeper meaning. That's why if you're looking for something to take on, maybe, uh, let's say you're not coming back to Yeshiva right away. And you want to have something to learn every day that's going to really stick to you. That's really going to have some power. And you think you only have half a minute a day. I say you think you only have a half a minute a day because it's like that old story about the guy asked his rabbi, he said, I have five minutes a day to learn. Should I learn chassidus or should I learn halacha? And the rabbi said, you should learn five minutes of chassidus. Because if you do, then you'll realize you have a lot more than five minutes a day to learn. <laughs> so you take 30 seconds a day and you learn how yin yin, and it expands. It grows on you. It grows in you. If you're looking to do something that's really big, that's really big. The effect is really big. Anyway, the Hayyim Yayim for tomorrow 
um, says that Lag Boimer by the Mitla Rebbe, the second Chabad Rebbe, was always considered a really big day. And they used to go out into the field and celebrate. And although the Mitla Rebbe, because of health, normally wouldn't say Lachayim on Mashke, but Lag Boimer he would. And there were many miracles that happened, especially miraculous blessings that were given to people, and especially miraculous blessings in connection with fertility, child, having children. Many people asked the Mitla Rebbe blessings on Lag Weimar for children, which came to pass. And uh, there's actually there's a story about a shliach, shliach and a shlucha, who were in the New York area, in the tri-state area, close enough so that when they made their Lag Boimer parade, they were able to come to 770 on that day and then return to their Mokim HaShlichas in time for the parade. So the Shlich came to 770 and he waited for the Rebbe to uh, come out of 770. And the Shlich said that since the Rebbe is the Mamali Mokim, of the Mitla Rebbe, since he is the one who takes the place, fills the place, fills the shoes, and is the continuation of the Mitla Rebbe, right? The Rebbeim are one chain. So therefore, this what it says about the Mitla Rebbe, I'm asking from the Rebbe. And although he and his wife had been childless for many years, he said, today is Lag Boimer, and I'm asking for Avrocha, for children. And that's exactly what happened. Anyway, Lag Boim is a big day. It's a big day for brachas. It's a big day for going to the oil. We could have a whole discussion later on. Where should be Lag Boim? In Meiron, at the oil. But we'll, we'll do that. Uh, we can have that discussion later. At any rate, so Lag Boim is connected very much with the Mitla Rebbe. And uh, the Mitla Rebbe has a nigun. Well, I'm, 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 you're probably tired of my voice. I'm going to let uh, Ali tell us about the Mitla Rebbe's nigun. Caught you off guard, huh? Yes. Yeah. So the, the, um, they say about the Mitla Rebbe that he was uh, so spiritually in tune, if that's the right, uh, no pun intended, oh. that he couldn't... That's he good. Could, he was not able to sing. Because if he would sing... He would have what's called Khoisa Nefesh. Just his soul would, would uh, leave his body before, you know, just. Right. So instead of, uh, like his father, the, like we mentioned, the, uh, the Alter Rebbe was a composer and uh, he sang and he, was, he read the Torah and he, you know. But, his, but uh, the Mitla Rebbe, he had instead, he had what's called the Kapelia. And the Kapelia was made up of singers and musicians. And um, and they would sing when when uh, when uh, I guess at Fabrengans or at different uh, occasions, they were they were the ones that led the uh, the singing. Um, at different occasions, uh, the Mitla Rebbe asked them to compose uh, a tune for something specific. For example, Berchus uh, Koinim, the uh, the Koin's blessing that we say on uh, on Yantif. He asked them to compose a tune for for this uh, blessing. Now we also have a nigan. It's called the Mitla Rebbe's Kapelia, um, and that is the um, I guess it's the most famous of the uh, of the nigunim that uh, that they would sing. Something like this.
that uh, Ellie has to be in Toronto tomorrow for a, for a wedding to be Misameach Chosen in the Kala this is what uh, a big part of what he does to share his gift is he goes to weddings and uh, we have to be respectful of that so when we spoke about tonight's uh, agenda I told Ellie we'd be, we'd be finished by 11 But he says, don't cut it short, because he doesn't want it to be, to be his fault. <laughs> so it'll be my fault. Also, everyone just arrived today? Today and yesterday? Okay, half of you got in last night, half of you got in today. People are jet lagged. What time is chassiz tomorrow morning? You don't have chassiz tomorrow morning? He has a wedding. I have a sore throat. Don't. Uh... We're going to have to see this now instead. So, so we know we have more time to prepare. So, 
I know, I know. Young people always want to stay up late. It's always a contest to see. You can find rain till dawn. We see no years, my Krishna shall shachris. Yeah, I know about that. Yeah. But sometimes uh, it's better. Sometimes less is more. And you hear a message that clicks, and that's enough, and you go sleep on it and see what uh, see how it grows on you. So I'll just uh, I'll share one more idea with you, but uh, then then you're on your own. You're never on your own because we're never alone. In fact, I think that's what I should tell you. There's a Hayyim Yayim that says that once upon a time the Rosh Hashiva was lonely or alone, he was elmed. And the Talmidim was an elmed. The students were lonely or alone. But what did the Alter Rebbe achieve? The Alter Rebbe, Ufketon, the Alter Rebbe accomplished that the Rebbe is not alone and the Chassidim are not alone. How did the Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, achieve that nobody should be alone? And what does it mean that previously they were alone? And specifically, the teacher was alone and the students were alone. They, they say that skill is hitting the target that no one else can hit. Genius is seeing the target that no one else can see. You have some people, Roshay ben Yisrael, the heads of the Jewish people. Why are they called the heads? Because just like the brain is the nerve center for everything that happens in the body, they are the focal point of Kal Yisrael. And they're like the heads, they're the highest point, they see the farthest. <coughs> and like they say, it's lonely at the top, right? What does it mean it's lonely at the top? Imagine you see what nobody else sees. Imagine you're the tzaddik, and you can see things that nobody else can see. You know what that feels like? To not, yeah, it feels lonely. That's right, lonely. That nobody can relate to your perspective because you see things that are just totally not shy. It's not possible for regular people to, to perceive and, and understand and comprehend. And so you're very lonely. And the students, for their part, they're also lonely because they know that this teacher who they they love and they're attached to, has more to tell them, but there's no way, there's no bridge. There's no common language. So the teacher's in his world, the students are, are, are in their world, and never the twin shall meet. What did the Alter Rebbe accomplish? Why do we say specifically it was the Alter Rebbe? who achieved that now the Rebbe is not alone and the Chassidim are not alone. The Alter Rebbe came along, and what did he innovate? Chassidus Chabad. He took Titus of Baal the teachings of the Holy Baal Shem Tov, and he presented them in a style called Chabad. Chachma Bina Das. What does that mean that the Alter Rebbe took Pnimiya Satayda, Saide Satayda, he took the deepest of the deep, the mystical secrets, and he put it in Chabad, in Chochme Bin Adas, in Moichen, in intellect. You know what it means? The Al Rebbe came up with the translation for infinity. He came up with a lexicon, with terminology, whereby the infinite, unknowable, could be translated into everyday language that normal people could learn about and be connected to ideas that it used to be that only very rare individuals could ever see. 
So Rabbi Shimon started by teaching a circle of students. In fact, they called them the circle. The Idr Rabba was the big circle. The more exclusive group was the Idr Zutta, the small circle. And in each generation, there were students, there were those who were initiated in Kabbalah, in the deeper secrets of the Torah. And even in the times of the Baal Shem Tov and the Magid, when there were more barriers of dissemination broken through, and Chassidus became even more available, there was still one more barrier, and that barrier was that things that are so lofty, generally you approach them with faith, which is how the Baal Shem Tov connected to all the simple Jews, not through intellect, but through faith, simple faith, came the Alter Rebbe and he said, we can take the things that are normally considered to be off the scale of intellectual achievement, and things that we normally only approach through simple faith, and you know what, we got a way to explain that stuff too. And now, the Rebbe is not alone, and Chassidim are not alone. That which the Nasi, Nasi is, the word means the leader, but also means the one who's uplifted. Like Nase, the Pasha Nase means to lift up. That now there's a language through which we can have that perspective. And what does that mean? Simple, 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 down to earth, what does that mean? It means that it used to be that there'd be one person in each generation who would worry about the world and everybody else would worry about themselves. Now, with Chassidus Chabad, especially the way that Rebbe taught it, every individual is supposed to worry about the world, to bring healing to the world. Not to fix people, we said that, not to fix people, but to fix the situation. And the biggest situation that needs fixing is Shechinta Begolusa, like Rabbi Shimon himself said. The Ingolus, the Shechina, Hashem's presence, Hashem himself, Kaviyachal, is languishing in exile. Not just the socio political exile, the, the, the metaphysical exile. And every one of us has a role in fixing that situation. Do you have a nigga from the Alter Rebbe? Yeah. The old nigger. The old.
song just goes in a circle, just the parts, one part leads into the other. Um, the Nigan of the Reb Marash was actually used, had the name Nigan Ein Soif. <laughs> that's because, uh, really, that's what a Nigan is, it just... You mean it was the original, this is the song that never ends? <laughs> this is the original song. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes on and on? <laughs> it could. Who would run out of air? <laughs> we gotta let we gotta let Rich finish the video. We can't keep going, right? We're over time, right? We're, whatever, you got, whatever you gotta do. No, one, no, I'm not. no, 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 no. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of us. <laughs> <laughs> no, How does Lachad Chilah start? You know it? Good enough? <laughs>
Can I make a request? Before we, we, we really, we have to have Rachmanis. Elias has to go to Toronto. It's a different country. You know, you know where Toronto is. <laughs> Canada. It's a different country. You have to go through customs, immigration. Okay, so one more. We're, we're going to ask Ellie to help us with one more new one. I, I heard everyone with the, you know, the Chachila Eriber. You know, the sounded good. So, sounded good. Everyone singing along. So, uh, how about we'll do? You know who the Shmuel Zayde was? Shmuel Zayde was one of the students of the Baal Shem Tov, as well as the Magid. And in fact, he's mentioned in Hayyim Yim. What does the Hayyim Yim say about Shmuel Zayde? That when he met the Baal Shem Tov, he was a child. Baal Shem Tov touched his touched his heart, and from that time on, he became warm. He became a warm Jew. It says if, it, if anything a tzaddik says or does, any movement of a tzaddik should leave an impression for the rest of your life. And that's what happened to Shmuel Zaydi. He became warm just from the Baal Shem Tov's touch when he was a child. So how about we do Kol Bayar, which means a voice in the forest. Ali will sing the hard parts, and we'll sing the fun parts. Is that a deal? Okay. All right. That's why I bring this guy with me. Does the heavy lifting. Did, um, yeah. yeah, in uh, 770, I don't remember. The, I don't know what year it's from. Uh, they started to sing the Nigun, and um, the verse first goes in Hebrew, then it repeats in Yiddish, and then somebody started to sing it in Russian, <laughs> Russian translation. And, sorry. And um, either he didn't know the words, or he all of a sudden he uh, had a solo. And uh, he got shy and he stopped singing. So the Rebbe, the Rebbe says to him, "From Beetle is in Nigunitarus. From being no song can come from being uh, humble." And uh, I'm sure, there's a deeper meaning. What's the simple meaning? The simple meaning is uh, when it's time to sing, you know, stand up and sing. You <laughs> can be humble later. But, uh, so uh, the thing is called Koyo Bayar, a voice in the forest. No, there's no English translation. At the moment, that's been uh, fit into the words. I'm sure that you've it. It's uh, basically a song about a, a. It's a conversation between a father and a son, where the son is calling out to the to his father, looking for him, searching for him, and. Um, and the father is answering, uh, my, my children, my son, where have you gone? Where, where are you? You know, so they're, they're both, they've lost each other. And the son says that the father is lost. And the father says that the son is lost. And um, that's the, um, the theme of the song. So the, the refrain... The Nigan part is That's the part. That's our part. That's your part. Okay. Again. Okay. 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 Ya 
ยาบายายายายายายายายาย
the hard part. He taught us an eagle. He taught us. Rabbi Yolufi Mudoy. That if someone teaches you anything, the Mishnah Pekri always says, you have to call them Rabbi, you have to call them your teacher. Ali taught us this nigun. We all have it. We have something to take away. We have a nigun to take away from a fabregen. A nigun is forever. We're walking down the road wherever you go. You know, go back to school and you're walking down the street, and you just start the nigun come back to you. And people think you're crazy. They'll see you singing, and maybe you'll teach it to somebody else, and then one less person will think you're crazy. Baruch Hashem. Okay. Thanks, Dali. Thanks to everybody.